Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, as always, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. We are a webinar, a webcast, an online show, um, whatever you want to call us. There is some um, uh, disagreement in the world about uh, what they call you call these things. <laughs> Or what people want to call these things but whatever you want to call us we are here live online every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time call us whatever you want but join us <laughs> but if you're unable to join us on, on Wednesday mornings that's fine uh, we do record all of our shows and post them on to our website um, they get put up on our YouTube channel for the Library Commission so you can go ahead and watch anything um, that you couldn't attend live there um, both the show the live show on Wednesdays and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So go ahead and share it with anyone you want to out there to check up on what we're doing. And we do a whole mixture of things here, um, presentations, interviews, book review sessions, mini training sessions. Um, basically anything is library related, um, we will have it on the show. Um, we do have Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes do sessions, and we also bring in guest speakers, and that's what we have this morning on the line with us uh, today from just south of us down in Kansas is Robin Hastings. Hello, Robin. Hello, Krista. Hello. And she is, there, as you can see her picture there, and you can see there she is a Director of Technology Services at our Northeast Kansas Library System, um, just over the border, kind of, from Nebraska. Mm -hmm. um, yep, we go all the way up to the Nebraska border. Cool, yeah. <laughs> and um, so she's on the line with us remotely from down there, and um, she's going to tell us everything you ever wanted to know about the cloud. Um, <laughs> that's a little too, too, not too intimidating, I hope. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, intimidated. <laughs> uh, or just the things you might want to know about the cloud um, that are uh, library related. Hopefully, <laughs> sure um, the ways and things you can do with it um, to help um, do some things maybe slightly a little differently, um, more efficiently, whatever, in your library. So I'm just going to hand over to you, Robin, to go ahead and take us, take it away. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I will tell you right now, I'm recovering from a cold, so if I drop out for a moment, it, it means that I have muted myself, so I'm not coughing in your ear. Um, I will try to try to do that. Um, and also, uh, on, the on the slide that you've got there now is my email address. If you have questions or, or uh, comments that you want to make, that's the easiest way to get a hold of me. Um, I'm almost always connected to my email and, and always willing to talk libraries and technology. So um, happy to happy to take questions or comments or or just hear what you guys are doing, uh, uh, especially if if something I have said has spurred you on to uh, trying something new. So we can't really start with um, a discussion of the cloud uh, without defining it, of course. Um, there is I, I usually use two different definitions for cloud. There's a very basic, simple definition that I use for uh, most folks, which is cloud is, is server and computing resources somewhere that isn't in your building. Um, it's, it's a way somewhere. And so you're using the resources through the network uh, and you're using them um, as they are hosted by someone else, which is a really basic definition, but it kind of gets at the at the point, um, one of the things that I have heard from folks when I give this definition is that they don't realize a lot of cloud stuff is exactly the same kind of thing that you have in your in your building. It's just that it's elsewhere. Um, there is, however, another definition that's a little techier, uh, and it is software and um, resources that uh, require specific elements to, uh, to be considered cloud-based. Um, it requires specific software and architecture that allows the data to be um, scalable. So one day you may only have five visitors, the next you have you know, 3,005 and your cloud architecture can handle that. Um, it can span servers, so if you want to add more resources, you can just plug in a new server and it'll automatically um, come up. Uh, it has to be um, multi-platform, which means because it's on the network, any kind of device should be able to access 
the service for it to be a cloud service. So um, whether you're accessing it from your desktop computer or from your iPhone or from your um, connected refrigerator, um, whatever, whatever kind of, of device you have, you should be able to access um, uh, your cloud services through that. Um, one of the things that a lot of cloud services have, and not all of them do, but is on-demand self-service. That means like for Gmail, you can go and create your own account. You don't ever have to talk to anybody. You don't have to make a call, and you don't have to wait for someone to approve you or do something in the background. It's, it's on-demand self-service. Um, I'm not sure that's a necessary definition of the cloud, but it's becoming a really common element of cloud-based stuff. And then finally, uh, measured service. In the past, when I would uh, rent or lease a, a, a space on a, in a server farm, I would pay for the machine, um, you know, the number of, of gigabytes of transfer, the amount of storage space. Um, all of that was included in what I paid. Uh, cloud services generally don't charge for hardware-based stuff. Um, they will charge for the amount that you use. So they measure your service, whether that's bandwidth or storage or computer cycles, processing cycles, however that happens to be measured. Um, you're, you're being charged for what you use, not what you, uh, not the hardware resources involved in that usage. And that's kind of a kind of why cloud computing tends to be so much more um, cost effective than uh, buying a server and sticking it somewhere because most servers, and I forget exactly where I read this um, um, statistic, but most servers uh, are only used to about 10% of their capabilities. So you have to buy a server that will handle the highest load that you'll throw on it but actually that, that kind of load is fairly rare. And so most of the time you're paying for server resources that are not being used. With cloud services, as you move stuff into the cloud, you're only paying for what you use. So that can, um, that can really save some money when you are uh, looking at server resources and, and that kind of thing. Um, with all that definition, being said. Uh, I'm not a purist in any way, shape, or form. I consider things to be cloud services that are not 100% conforming to this definition, um, but at least they hit the high points. And so some of the stuff that I talk about may not have on-demand self-service or it may not be um, something that specifically um, moves uh, can move from one server to another very easily, but it's it hits the high points. Robin, I think that uh -huh. this is such a new, new-ish area that I think that's probably why it's, the concept of what it is is changing and still being discussed too of what could or couldn't be considered cloud, and it's not really a Certainly. set in stone type thing. Right, exactly. And the the elements of the definition that I um, I've come up were, with are basically from the NISO and ISO and I have no idea what it stands for. Um, I can't remember yeah. right off the top of my head, but it, it comes from that definition. But that changes on a fairly mm -hmm. regular basis as technology changes. Okay, so um, what kinds of things are cloud-like? Uh, some of you may have run across some of these uh, initialisms or, or uh, um acronyms before, and uh, these are the most popular of the cloud services. Um, the SAAS is Software as a Service, and that's going to encompass things like um, your Gmail and your Google Docs. Um, it will encompass pretty much most of what I talk about today, actually, is going to be a Software as a Service. Um, it's any software that normally uh, in the past you would have had on your computer, you now uh, access through your computer, but it's not actually, you know, Gmail doesn't live on your machine. So you're actually accessing the cloud-based version of email. Um, and so that is a pretty wide, wide range of services, and, and I'll talk about a lot of them um, this morning. 
Uh, the next most popular version is infrastructure as a service. Most of you have probably heard of Amazon Web Services. Uh, this is, was the first really big cloud uh, infrastructure where you can actually um, rent server resources um, that are bare. You're not necessarily buying uh, an operating system or a particular um, piece of software. You're, you're actually buying the computing resources to run an operating system or a piece of software or something like that. And so that's what infrastructure as a service is. And a lot of libraries have gone from having, you know, seven or eight servers in their basement uh, running various server applications to offloading that onto something like AWS. Um, Microsoft has an option now called um, Azure is their cloud uh, uh, service. And then of course Google has cloud resources as well. And they all offer the infrastructure for your applications as a service. And that's what that IAAS is. Um, and you'll occasionally hear PAAS, Platform as a Service, and this is kind of a combination of the first two where um, you're buying both the infrastructure and a particular set of software pieces that are specifically tuned and, and put together for developers. We don't see this as often in, in libraries, maybe really big libraries that have developers on staff, but it is something that you'll occasionally see uh, mentioned, so I thought I would I would bring it up. Um, let's see. Yeah, there we go. So that's the definition portion of our um, webinar today. Uh, now we're going to talk about taking that definition and making it useful for libraries. And some of the things I'm going to talk about are um, cloud ILSs and and ILSs there are very few really cloud based services that match all of those definitions I gave you but there are becoming more and more externally managed and hosted ILSs that are pretty close to cloud based so we'll talk about some of those um, web hosting is kind of a traditional cloud based um, service but that's something that is also available for libraries um, to use uh, backups, uh, those are moving to the cloud. Uh, computer management, and by this I mean both managing a computer to mate, for maintenance and, and you know, doing kind of computer desktop stuff, moving that to the cloud, but also managing computers in a lab situation like in a computer center. Uh, I'll talk about a little bit of both of those in that slide. Uh, email and document creation storage, that I, I'm going to mentioned Google a lot, I have a feeling, um, but that is kind of, that's your, your office and email on the, in the cloud, and that is moving um, ever more, ever more into the cloud. Even Microsoft is starting to push people into using more cloud-based Word and, and uh, Excel as opposed to the downloadable stuff. Um, and for libraries, uh, sometimes that can be, uh, again, that can be a really handy thing to to do because it offloads a lot of the updating and, and that kind of thing um, off there. So we'll talk about that when we get to that slide. Um, social media, your social media is generally in the cloud. Um, social media really does fit the, the definition of cloud-based to a T. Um, so if your social media is in the cloud, the way you manage it should be in the cloud as well, right? So we'll talk about uh, um, that a little bit there. And then finally, we'll talk about some of the graphical editors that are in the cloud, kind of as we're talking about um, different software that, that is up there as well, but focusing on, on graphical editors because we're all familiar with the 800 pound, at least $800 uh, gorilla in the uh, a uh, graphical world, Photoshop, uh, there are options. If you can't afford Photoshop, um, there are options to, to that. So uh, graphical editors and all kinds of other types of software project management stuff, those are all moving to the cloud as well. Uh, 
Okay, this is um, my my choice of image for leading into the ILS on the cloud. This is about as far from cloud-based as as I could find on Flickr. So, with that uh, in mind, what the past has been, we'll look at the at the future. WorldCat Web Management was one of the first commercial cloud services uh, ILSs um, to the market. It was uh, perhaps not the absolute first, but it was the first biggish one. It was from OCLC, and so um, it was uh, it was put up as a completely cloud-based way to manage your library through WorldCat and OCLC um, services. Uh, Jason Griffey uh, led the University of Tennessee Chattanooga in using it. Um, he before he he uh, left to become a a world hopping uh, library consultant. Uh, he was the IT manager uh, there at at the University of Tennessee, and he really led that project and was was a uh, definite. Uh, innovator in getting that going for the University of Tennessee and and he talks an awful lot about it uh, the process in his pattern recognition blog uh, a quick Google search of pattern recognition and Griffey will will bring that up pretty quickly um, he talks a lot about what his thinking was what the process was what the benefits were um, and and I think some of the uh, uh, issues that he ran into as well so if you're interested in you know, going that direction for your library, that's a really good first-hand account of, of how they managed it. Um, slightly less cloudy, but definitely still hitting most of the definitions, is uh, Koha, which is an open source, not commercial, um, but an open source uh, ILS that a company called Bywater from New Zealand um, is um, well actually I think the company I'm not sure the company isn't actually in New Zealand most of the folks are here in the US but uh, it was but it originated uh, there I believe correct it originated there yeah, yeah I think so yeah um, and I know the uh, yeah a lot of the first people who worked there were from New Zealand Koha has been or New Zealand's been very big in, with Koha development um, they are offering a cloud-based access to um, Koha. So here at Nichols, since uh, 2008, we have been customers, and we don't pay for Koha. Koha is free. We pay, however, Bywater to host, manage, and kind of support our use of the Koha software. So um, while we use Koha here in Kansas, it's actually stored on a server in Rackspace, um, which is a, a web hosting and and uh, cloud service offering company in Texas um, and I'm pretty sure that's where our server is but I'm not 100% sure it could have moved somewhere that's kind of the joy of, of uh, this cloud stuff is I don't have to know all those details all I know is that Bywater knows where it is and they're managing it and uh, I don't have to worry about all of the headaches that come with servers um, up to and including, you know, security issues. Um, that's all handled by by Water and Rackspace uh, together. Um, and Evergreen in Missouri is similar. They have, I think, they actually host the uh, Evergreen service in Missouri, but it's not hosted in the individual libraries. They all connect to a central location in Missouri. So for the libraries, Evergreen is also a cloud-based um, service. Um, both of those are sort of cloud-based in that um, they are uh, sort of self-serve, but not really. I mean, if we wanted, if you wanted to create a Koha web service, you couldn't, or web catalog, you can't just go to a, a online form and sign up and, and never talk to anybody and, and get it. So it's not 100% self-serve, um, but it is multi-platform. It'll work on my phone, it'll work on my tablet, it'll work on my desktop. Um, it's scalable. If we need more services, we can um, get them very easily. They'll just, you know, they just kind of uh, um, are very easy to add. Um, 
distributed, I think at one point, I have no idea right at the moment if that's still true, but at one point we had our catalog split amongst a couple of different servers. Um, and the, the general point there is that we don't have to know. Um, it can be distributed or not. That's not something I need to be aware of. And then we actually pay by the service model as opposed to buying a server and paying for server access. Okay, sorry. Um, okay, and there are more announced every day. Well, here in a couple of slides, I'll talk about yet another one. Um, but moving on to the cloud is kind of kind of the way things are going. So even if you have a server right now in your library that is managing your ILS, um, your next ILS, you will definitely have options. Um, I'm pretty sure. Um, that Triple I is looking at cloud-based um, options for service. Uh, so some of the bigger commercial ones are heading that direction. So um, you could probably stay with your traditional in-building ILS for a while, but but I think the the trend is heading towards being uh, cloud-based more and more. Um, and the web hosting, like I mentioned earlier, is kind of a traditional, it's been on the cloud for probably the longest of anything we've been talking about. But there are definite uh, library related and library specific cloud hosts that I wanted to, to mention. Uh, the first one is LIS host and Blake Carver was just on Encompass a couple of weeks ago. If you're a regular listener, you might have heard him. Um, he was talking about security in libraries. And he also, along with being a, a library security expert and a um, having a day job at Lyricis, he also runs uh, library and information, or actually I'm not sure, library, I'm not 100% sure what LIS host stands for now that I think about it. Um, but it is a library specific uh, web hosting service that he, he provides. Uh, he has a lot of WordPress sites, uh, and he really does tend to stick with just libraries. Um, so if you want someone who understands libraries, understands the needs of security and, and uh, patron confidentiality and all of that, um, LIS Host is an awesome uh, choice. And uh, really, Blake didn't pay me to say that, but I... <laughs> I do think he's he's got a, an excellent uh, service going on there. Um, but another one, just in case uh, uh, you want options, Library World also offers library-specific hosting. And they have a cloud ILS. It's not as big. It's not as well-known as WorldCat. But it is a cloud ILS that you can get with your um, with your website. I've not heard a whole lot about Library World. I don't. I don't know that I'm. I'm very familiar with their service, um, but it's an option, um, and and it's something that you can definitely look at. And then there are smaller um, options, like in Kansas. Here we have the Kansas Libraries on the Web service, CLOW, and we offer. 212, I think is at last count, uh, libraries in Kansas, a WordPress site. And we, when I started at Nichols, this was run off of a Blade server, um, which is one of those, you know, long, thin uh, servers in, uh, in the server closet at the building here in Nichols. And um, I moved it to AWS um, because Basically, the Blade server died, uh, and we didn't have uh, anywhere else to go with it. <laughs> um, I moved it to AWS, and now it's in the process of being moved to Rackspace, actually, where we will actually have a fully cloud architecture, at which point um, we will no longer have to create websites for folks. They can create their own accounts, do their own thing. Um, we can do this because it is free to libraries. The, Kansas system support it, so it's not, you know, libraries don't have to pay anything for this. Um, it is paid for by their by their systems, and that is kind of where where we're going in uh, in libraries. 
yeah, with web hosting. Uh, yes, and here in Nebraska, we have a, a, almost a very similar thing here, almost exactly what you're doing on Nebraska libraries on the web. Mm -hmm. um, that we run here out of the Library Commission, same thing. We run wet WordPress sites for libraries. Um, not sure exactly how many libraries we have in the group now. Uh, God, it's got to be about a, almost 100. Uh -huh. <laughs> I don't know the exact number, but yeah, we host them here through the Library Commission. Same thing, free to libraries. Um, to If they need a website, we will do it for them. And it's awesome. been a very popular program, definitely, yeah. Oh sure. Well, you know, free free website mm -hmm, and uh, technical support and, and all that help. Um, it's also, I mean, I mean, I'm sure if Kansas and Nebraska are doing it, while we are generally ahead of the curve in in many things um, here in in Kansas, and I know you are as well in Nebraska. If we're doing it, then other states are probably doing it. I'm just not aware of it because <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> for the most part, that's that's not where I've. Uh, I have lived. So um, if you're in a state other than Nebraska or Kansas, that's something you can check with your state library or, or commission or, or system and see if that's something that uh, they can offer for you guys too. Um, backups. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that I appreciate so much as an IT person uh, is cloud backups because I distinctly remember the days of having to change the tapes in a backup system and put some tapes in a, a box to take to a, a location 20 miles down the road um, so that we had backups that were physically secure. Um, today, and actually right before I left Merle, I had, I had switched us. <laughs> I was sick of tapes. Um, so I had switched us to um, using online backups and we use online backups here at, at Nichols as well and there are several options. Uh, Dropbox gives you two gigabytes of space per account for a personal single computer kind of kind of thing and that's awesome for um, computer level backups if you just have a few computers that you want to back up set up each person with a Dropbox or a box.net they do generally the same thing I'm more familiar with Dropbox myself, but I'm pretty sure that Box.net, sorry, I'm <laughs> still stuffy. Um, Box.net does about the same thing there with the, um, the file system. Um, so you set up a Dropbox account and you point it to, say, your My Documents folder. And every time you save something in your My Documents folder, it is automatically and immediately uploaded to the Dropbox cloud server. Um, if you are like me and um, work at home quite a bit, uh, you could then install Dropbox on your home computer and everything that you've worked on at work is by the time you get home updated and at the final version um, on your home computer. Uh, this is this is useful in many different ways beyond just making sure that everything is backed up. Uh, but backups are a definite plus for that. Uh, if you want to do a more organized organization level backup, Crash Plan or Mosey Pro are options. Um, again, I've used Crash Plan. I've not used Mosey Pro, but they're very similar. With Crash Plan, um, you can pay either by computer or by amount of space used. Um, and what we did at Merle was we had all of our individual computers um, backing up to a server and then we backed up that server to crash plan, which meant we were really only paying for one computer and it was under $10 a month um, for unlimited storage. So uh, if you consider how much you spend on tapes and, and driving things back and forth and, and or CDs, however you guys do your backups, um, on on without the cloud, um, then you can see that this would be uh, probably a a much cheaper option. And then for a techie level backup, uh, you've got the AWS where you you like I said when we were talking about the infrastructure as a service, you can buy just space to put 
stuff. Um, and that's more of a techie option because it does require using a secondary syncing software to sync um, your information on your computer to the AWS stuff. Um, for those of you who are kind of interested in that sort of thing, uh, BitTorrent has a sync client that does a really nice job of that. Um, but a lot of the, a lot of the um, smaller backup, not these necessarily the bigger ones here, but a lot of the smaller backup places use an AWS or a Google or a Microsoft Azure um, kind of layer behind their backups to um, to store your stuff. So this is just kind of cutting out the middleman on AWS. Uh, might be a little cheaper if you buy directly from the the source. Um, the, the main thing that I wanted to, to get across here on the backups is that if you have a backup plan that requires relying on a human being to remember something, um, it's going to fail. And likely it's going to fail exactly when you need it the most. People forget to save things to their USB drives or their tape drives or they forget to change tape drives. Um, they forget to move things and then, you know, a fire happens and all of a sudden the server went up in flames with the tapes that were backing up and and you've, you've got a fa huge failure on your hands. So um, I definitely want to encourage you, if you're not already, um, to look into this kind of, of thing because these are automated. Like I said with Dropbox, the minute you hit save on a file, it immediately syncs up to your Dropbox account on the on the cloud and you have immediate backups, no no waiting. Um, CrashPlan, Mozy Pro generally do their thing overnight, so you may lose, you know, a half a day's work if something happens, but you'll never lose more than that because it's automatic. That being said, even automated things like these uh, cloud things need to be tested occasionally because um, we're still humans setting them up and, and mistakes happen. So do keep that in mind as well. But I just wanted to um, um, stress that as much, the more human activity you have involved in your backup plan, the more points of failure you have. And the more likely it is that when you most need your backups, they won't be there. Okay, well that being said, um, We'll go on to computer management, and um, for just general computer management, file storage, um, a lot of people have file servers in their um, in their networks, in their organizations that do file storage, and you can outsource that to something like Dropbox or Box.net. Um, I don't have it on the slide here, I missed it completely, but there's also a kind of cloud-based um, updater called Ninite, and that's N-I-N-I-T-E, and it does um, updates of software, so, you know, everything from your browser to your um, um, office equipment, or office software to um, plugins, Flash, Shockwave, that kind of thing, all of that can be managed um, through a piece of software that lives on your computer. That part's not, not on the cloud, but it actually uses the cloud to um, have clean uh, versions of downloads and uploads and, and upgrades that you might need. And I mentioned the clean because I just read an article yesterday on um, how there are almost no download sites anymore that don't bundle um, malware or, or extra software of some sort into their, um, into the downloads. Uh, used to be that there were a couple of clean ones, SourceForge was clean, now they're saying that SourceForge has even started doing it. So Ninite is one of the few places where you know you can go and get clean versions and you don't even have to do it. You, you set Ninite up to run uh, monthly and it automatically updates all of your software that you've got set up and it does it over the network from the cloud without any um, hands-on stuff from you. So that is 
that is definitely something to consider as well. Um, switching gears to public computer center management, uh, a lot of libraries use some kind of time management solution. Um, there are commercial versions out there, SAM, um, and Ever Envisionware, I keep wanting to say Evernote, but Envisionware, um, Cassie. There are also some that are cloud-based in, in that you don't have the server running the time management software in your um, in your library itself, but rather it's hosted elsewhere. Uh, one of the first of the time management solutions that are, are cloud-based is userful. Um, another one that is, is available sort of right now is LibKey. It's still, still being developed. Um, it is not 100% out there for for every um, for final use, but it is coming along and it's probably usable now. We're actually going to start demoing it here at Neckles very soon. Uh, but it is hosted. It's kind of like the um, our Koha. It's hosted by someone else. In this case, also by Water, um, and it's managed. They manage and maintain it, and then. Um, Individual computers in individual libraries connect to our LibSkey instance in the cloud, and that manages their time based on their library's rules and regulations. So, um, and that is, is generally how userful, and, and there are probably others that are coming out uh, uh, that are cl becoming cloud-based as well. For lab management, this is really a school product, but um, it works really well in public computer centers if you want to be able to remotely hit a, um, a computer either to send a message or turn it off or um, in other, other um, activities that you want to do from the desk as opposed to having to, to go out into the lab and, and uh, um, manage the, these computers. The option that I found, the only option that I found that is cloud-based is Land School, and again, it's it's something you you create an account, you connect your PCC computers, your computer lab computers to your account on the on the cloud, and then from there you can have a master computer that can manage these uh, uh, machines from a distance. Mm. Um, this slide is a little repetitive, I'm well aware. Uh, email and document management is, is a pretty mature um, segment of cloud services as opposed to some of the others we've been talking about where, you know, there are beta versions and, and all this. Um, email and document management is, is mature. It is, it is uh, something that has been in use for many years and there are lots of options and they all do about the same thing because as one gets a feature the other two jump on and and so they're all sort of in the same general boat um, your choice is on kind of price point although they're very similar in prices your choice basically is is what kind of user experience you want. They all have a little bit of a different um, dashboard, a little bit different um, feel to them. Uh, Google Docs is one that is um, frequently used in, in libraries uh, and schools and workplaces. <laughs> um, and it does email documents, calendars, just like Soho Office and Microsoft 360, which is the uh, where Microsoft is trying to push uh, more people to using their online cloud versions um, of their software as opposed to downloading and having to maintain and manage and upgrade and update and do all that with with their um, Word and Excel and, and that kind of software. So um, most of us are familiar with cloud-based email even if you're you're not using it at work, you probably have a, a Google or a Yahoo or a Hotmail account. Those are all cloud emails. Um, and then document management, a lot of us are familiar with Google Docs or Office 360, um, Word, Excel, and, and uh, 
uh, PowerPoint. So those are, are all your options for email and document management. Um, social media management. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to know how many of you, and I don't know if, if there's a way to raise your hand or whatever, but uh, how many of you actually do manage your social media in any formal way? Yeah, there is um, a hand raising icon that people can click on on your okay. GoToWebinar interface. If you do use any of these or something else maybe, uh, go ahead and raise your hand. Click the little hand raising icon on your interface and we can uh, see if we've got people Take doing it. But two so far. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, don't, I don't actually use anything. Well, you mentioned Hootsuite there, which is which you can mm -hmm. monitor multi. I know you could use that because I used to use that to monitor multiple um, mm -hmm. Twitter accounts. Mm -hmm. um, there are a couple of different ways to manage social media. You can passively just kind of get alerts. Um, let's that let you know when your library is being mentioned. The alert that I have here on the image um, that's kind of um, off to the side here. Let me. Oh well, that's not what I intended to do. Um, this alert that's over uh, on the side. Yeah, I can see it. Okay, it's. Uh, uh, that is actually a Google alert that I have set up to pull any news item that has the word library or libraries in it. Um, me, there we go. That's what I wanted. Um, you'll notice this is the query term, library or libraries, eight new results for library or libraries, um, is what I do the search for. And so I can get um, an alert every day that gives me kind of a, a way to just quickly scan through and see what's going on in libraries that day. Mm -hmm. uh, Social Mention does much the same thing. Um, it's just slightly, it, it's a little bit broader as it doesn't focus specifically on Google News. Um, and that kind of thing is just kind of a passive um, getting information kind of alert, see what people are talking about if your library is in the news or um, with social mention and tweet, Twitter or Facebook or that kind of thing. Management, which you mentioned Hootsuite is um, one of the options, that's more both getting those alerts and getting the information into you and allowing you to schedule posts and um, one of the things I really liked about Hootsuite was you can test when the good, the best time to put posts out. So you can see, you know, if I post on Twitter at 9 a.m. on Monday and I post on Twitter at 2 p.m. on Tuesday, which one gets the most retweets, hmm. mentions, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so you can kind of start fine-tuning when you post. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that manages, you know, Facebook and and. Uh, uh, a bunch of others as well. I use TweetDeck um, for that because we have multiple, mm -hmm. I have my own Twitter account and then multiple ones that we run for the Library Commission. And TweetDeck is Twitter's own, well, it used to be separate, but I believe they <laughs> bought it. Yeah, it's their version of the same thing where I have multiple accounts and I can have call things that I can track certain hashtags and whatnot all in, mm -hmm. yeah, for different topics. And TweetDeck is now available as a cloud. When I first started using TweetDeck, it was a downloadable application. Yes. But it I is that now available on the cloud, so you can yeah. you can access it through your web browser. Yep, that's all I do now is I don't even do the downloaded one anymore. It's just easier. I, mm -hmm. It's one of my tabs on my face on my Firefox. <laughs> well, I know when I go to conferences, um, I fire up my tweet deck, and that's about the only time I use it anymore. Um, but I do fire it up, and then I start. I do you know, searches for my Twitter handle, searches for mm -hmm. the conference hashtag, searches for um, maybe the topic of the conference so I can mm -hmm. catch things that people are talking about that who aren't using the hashtag. Um, right. And then, you know, maybe a couple of friends so I can see what they're doing and make sure and join them when they, uh, when they go out, <laughs> that kind of thing. Of course. Um, but it's very handy for mm -hmm. that. And it's also handy for doing that same kind of search, having several columns and keeping an eye on, 
you know, your your library's Twitter handle and your library's event um, hashtags if you have them, and any mention of your library, uh, and and that's where what to track comes in handy. Um, and you'll have to possibly refresh my memory on this, Krista. Does uh, can you do searching by zip codes on TweetDeck? I don't know. So you I've can, never tried. I've just I done like certain it. words, phrases, and mm -hmm. hashtags, and I've got columns for different things that way. Yeah. I haven't tried. I don't it. remember um, if if that's see. possible or not. I know <laughs> on some of these, like Hootsuite, and <clears> I know Sprout <throat> Social, you can limit your um, search to just Twitter users who are in a particular zip code. Hmm. Um, so that is is kind of a handy thing for for local libraries, of course. And um, hashtags, that's only we if talked about people that. have entered have that put that information in mm -hmm. their profile or something. It, yeah, yeah, it does. But this uh, is a quickie um, search. I don't see it really working. But <clears throat> no, but as I may a, not be doing it right either. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, that's and and I know when I've used it in the past, it is. Um, it was a, a feature, and I'm thinking it was on Hootsuite or Sprout Social, one of the two, um, that let me kind of filter out. I, w I only wanted people who were talking about libraries in my general area. Um, now, you're still going to miss a few. Like like Krista said, that only catches people who, who put their location in their Twitter handle. But um, You're going to have to experiment with what works best to yeah. catch the most, yeah. Exactly, and that brings up the final thing to track misspellings. Uh, don't just search for the properly spelled name. Uh, if there are common misspellings, use those as well because um, people do tend to misspell things on occasion. And finally, um, the last of the software that I'll mention, uh, I talked a little bit about the 800-pound uh, gorilla uh, Photoshop. A lot of us cannot afford to have uh, a computer lab full of computers that have Photoshop on them. So one of the things that you can offer that or use for the library itself is um, online graphical editors and store, storage spaces. Um, for editors and creators, and these are editors that are full-fledged, you could actually create new images or edit yeah, images that are already existing. Um, Pixlr and Splash Up are two options that are very, um, they're very powerful. Uh, the part of the 80-20 rule that many of you would probably be familiar with is that 80% um, of people only use 20% of the features of any particular software. And Pixlr and Splash Up encompass at least 20% of the features of Photoshop, if not more. So for the vast majority of what you need to do, um, these are going to be helpful. If you would, you like the um, filtering options that Photoshop has, Photoflexer and Lunapic specialize in taking a, an existing image and adding filters or editing. You know, um, I know Photoflexer has really powerful red eye. Uh, removal uh, options, and so that's that's an option there. And then, of course, for storage and not just storage, but sharing of pictures. Libraries um, are big on on sharing, and uh, so not only for storage but for sharing. Uh, Picasa, which is a Google site now, I believe, uh, part of Google Plus, and Flickr is a a well known photo sharing site that has lots of options to let libraries um, offer images both from their events that they take they have and from their collection if you've got older stuff as well. I do believe the Library of Congress has a really nice collection of, of images on Flickr. It's a good place to go. Okay, so to finish up, um, We've talked about a bunch of different kinds of services, software as a service generally, in the cloud. And when you're looking at these kind of services, some of the things you can, you need to take into account, um, first and foremost, is security. Uh, 
I have heard um, a bunch of people talk about how they just don't feel comfortable putting stuff on on the cloud because they hear so many break-ins and, and issues. But my feeling is those big services, they have a whole bunch of people who do nothing but security. That's their job. And um, at most libraries, we have nobody whose entire job is, is securing our, our services. And you can get by. Security by obscurity works for a little while, but not forever. Um, there are too many bad guys out there scanning every single node on the network looking for something um, soft that they can hit and try to get in. When I worked at, at Merle in Missouri, we had a server that, as I said before, it had lots of storage room that was not being used and we had very good bandwidth um, and so they thought oh hey this is a great place to put our cracked software and movies and we had no idea they were there until the FBI showed up and took our server um, so we were obscure um, we had firewalls and and all kinds of stuff in place but nobody was charged with maintaining the security of our service. If we had file server out on the web, um, there's somebody watching, somebody knows when something's happening. So that is why I'm, I tend to lean towards, yes, there are issues, but the issues are better contained and more, um, and quite frankly, less they happen less than uh, in the cloud than they do in in our individual organizations. Um, when you're evaluating your cloud service, take a look at the training that is available. Uh, a lot of services offer excellent training. Take advantage of that. Um, and then um, think about your bandwidth capabilities. If you are taking some fairly processor heavy um, computation like graphical imagery and taking that from your computer and moving it onto the cloud, um, you no longer need to have such a powerful computer in front of you, but you do have to have a pretty good pipe connecting your computer to um, the cloud so that you can move those big images and move those those things around. So uh, if you're evaluating services, make sure you have the bandwidth to support the service that you're you're looking for. Um, as you're moving into cloud-based things, the comfort level of your staff is important. Um, it's always a good idea to provide training on these new services so that they understand the benefits, they become comfortable with the new workflows, um, and that kind of thing. So that's the training is definitely a help. And finally, um, Trade-offs are, are a fact of life. <laughs> we all uh, have to, to figure what is best for our particular uh, organization. Um, thinking about features of the software, uh, like I said, especially with the graphics software, because they are network-based, they are not as full-featured as your Photoshop or even GIMP, um, if you're looking for, at the open source uh, software. So you want to um, consider that you may have people who just cannot do their work on the on these more limited things, and you'll need to buy a non-cloud-based software for them. Um, and then convenience, uh, I tend to find cloud services convenient um, in the extreme because I don't have to update them, I don't have to upgrade them, I'm not worried about the security. Um, all of that is handled by someone else. All I have to do is use the software. So that's that's a big thing for me. And then, of course, um, price. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, cloud software is generally going to be cost effective for your organization most of the time. Not always. There are times when, when it will not be so cost effective. So um, those are kind of things you have to, to work out yourself. Now, it's 11 o'clock, so I've been babbling at you for an hour. Um, I would like to take this moment to do some shameless self-promotion and mention that the book, 
making the most of the cloud that I wrote a year or so ago is now um, available at uh, Amazon Find Library Distributors. You may even be able to find it at a library near you where you can read it for free. That's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, so most of this information that I've given you today is contained in there plus a bunch more. So if I have whet your appetite for cloud services in your library, this is a good next step. And I don't just say that because I'm the author. I, no, I do just say that because I'm the author. Well, okay. your, your book was, you know, one of the, <laughs> the main reasons I grabbed you to ask you to come on the show is because of knowing about the book that you had written. So, um, yes, it's, uh, I came to you from that direction. Yes. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So that's, what I have to say about mm -hmm. services making the most of the cloud. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Are there, were there any thank big you. questions? Um, yeah, well, thank you very much, Robin. No, that was that was great. That's exactly what I was looking forward to myself. Some of those, as I said, are services I've used. Um, I've used Pixlr, like I said, in Hootsuite, Dropbox. Mm -hmm. I can't remember everything else. <laughs> as I said, we do WordPress here. Actually, WordPress is what we use for the library mm -hmm. mission zone. Um, we hosted we mm -hmm. are on our own actual physical servers here so we actually uh -huh. make sure of, we have the physical piece of equipment but then as i said just like the the kansas libraries on the web we then offer it as to to the libraries a cloud service right for them exactly. to have so um it's kind of both um does anybody have any questions you can type them into your question section of your GoToWebinar interface um nothing came in while you were talking um maybe just taking notes furiously or keeping track of things. Um, but just let everyone know while we're going through this too, um, all of the websites and tools and everything that Robin did mention, I am saving into our delicious account. I got through about halfway through and then I got, you know, caught up in other things. But um, um, I, before I put up the, the recording, all of those will be in there. Um, so you don't have to worry about trying to figure out what they were. We'll have links to them. And the slides that you have there, Robin, um, will you send them to me or will you give me a link? I and I can link to them anywhere, whichever works for you. I so, will. I would have sent them earlier, but I was still working on them at that's, nine. Hey, so. that's perfect. <laughs> so whenever, yeah. So you'll have reference to that as well to, to look at as well. So if anyone does have any questions, use your GoToWebinar interface. Type them in. Um, I did have one thing that came up um, that I was thinking about, which I know mm -hmm. we've, we've experienced ourselves um, things. These cloud services are great. I like I said, I use a lot of them myself. Um, Flickr, anything G, <laughs> G uh -huh, Google uh -huh. stuff. Um, what happens though if these services close down and disappear? How um, do you, that is, what is that? What how can you prepare be prepared for that potential? Um, especially for cloud services, you're not paying for. Mm -hmm. um, that is that is something you should consider. Um, one of the things that, one of the definitions of cloud um, services that I don't, I'm not 100% sure I agree with because I, I, there's a lot of, a lot of discussion, but um, one of the things is that it's movable. You can, you could take your data out mm. of that cloud and move it to a different service in a different cloud with no, um, no real issues. Um, for a lot of services like with the Google services, you can download everything in your drive mm -hmm. to your computer. Um, there's actually a little piece of software that Google Drive offers that syncs your um, cloud versions of your documents to your computer so that you can work on them offline, but it also serves as a, if Google goes belly up tomorrow and everything goes away, you've got copies of everything on your desktop. Mm -hmm. um, Email is harder. You can download email from Google uh, in archive bundles, um, but uh, I don't know if too many people who actually do that. Um, yeah, that seems a little. <laughs> it's, it's again, if you're if you're uh, relying on a human being to remember to do things for backup, it's it's just gonna fail. Um, and that's I don't do it. Um, I I don't. Uh, I don't know of anybody who does. So, uh, but the main thing that, and that's kind of part of evaluating, um, one of the questions I ask uh, when I'm, I'm looking at a new cloud service is, how do I get my stuff out? And um, that's what I was going to say. That's one of the things you'd want to put into your evaluation of it is mm -hmm. do you want to plan for that you might need sure. at some point and what way do they have to do that? Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Or, and I know this makes more work, but 
having stuff in multiple places to begin with. Yeah. Um, I mean, that um, does there's make a concept. Really, yeah. Sure. There's a concept called LOCKS, L-O-C-K-S-S, and it stands for lots of copies keeps stuff safer. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a big... Uh, a big thing like I my Dropbox um, I have I have my Dropbox on a laptop on a desktop you know it's just it's everywhere so if Dropbox were to go out of business tomorrow I still have my data your stuff wouldn't um, disappear yeah my stuff yeah. would disappear um, and that's you know that's kind of like I said that's just something that if that's as important to you and and for some things it might be for some things it might not um, then that's something that that you need to look at when you're evaluating. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Cool. Well, it doesn't look like any other questions came in while we were talking. Um, I well, think you're really <laughs> comprehensive, so that's awesome. <laughs> um, so since nothing really, nobody had any desperate questions at the moment, um, I think we will um, officially wrap up. Um, if anybody right. does have questions, as, as Robin saw, she did have her email on there, her Gmail at the beginning, and that will be included in this when we get the slides later. So um, definitely. definitely reach out to her for any um questions or help you might need with using any of your cloud services. Awesome. Yeah. So thank you very much, Robin. I'm going to pull back screen sharing here to my computer now. Okay. There well, we thank go. you for inviting me. Yeah. Thanks so much. I was glad to have you on the show. Like I said, this is a um, important topic. Uh, lots of stuff every now and then you see things about this coming up. So it's definitely something people need to be aware of as mm -hmm. new and different ways to do. And I know a lot of libraries, I think one of the first things maybe that they encounter is either the Gmail or working into mm -hmm. getting an ILS. That's some new way of doing it, yeah. being able to save money and do that better. Um, but knowing that there's so many other options of things that you could do that you maybe didn't think about. Um, mm -hmm. is great yeah um, awesome. so yeah thank you so much thank you everyone for attending the show is being recorded as it always is and will be available on our website here on the Encompass Live website afterwards um, all of our recordings go right here and the link right beneath upcoming sessions is our archived Encompass Live sessions and um, today's will be on here as well. We have all of our recordings here from all of our shows going back to the very, very beginning which was in January of 2009 when we started the show so you will have um, like this one, you have view to the link to the recording on YouTube, presentation on our SlideShare account, and then links in our Delicious account. As I said, over here is where I was collecting the links as we were going through. Um, I'll have to grab some more. I didn't catch them all during the show. <laughs> um, and I did find um, Robin's book is both available, of course, to purchase on Amazon, and I found the WorldCat link in um, OCLC. So um, you can borrow it from a library up there if your library doesn't already have it. <laughs> Uh, so that will wrap it up for today's show. I hope you'll join us next week when our topic is a local topic for us, Nebraska Access Expansion. Nebraska Access is our database website. Where we have lots of databases that are purchased by the Library Commission for the use of libraries across the state, and lots of changes are coming through. New lineup, new things, EBSCO changing, and um, so next week we will have our um, Nebraska Access team, I'll call them. Uh, Devra, Alana, and Susan will be on with us to explain exactly what's happening, when things are happening, and what's going on with that. So definitely do sign up for that show or any of our other future topics that we've got listed here on our website. Also, Encompass Live is on Facebook. So if you are a big Facebook user, definitely do go pop over there and like our page. Once it gets loaded up here, there we go. Um, I post reminders of when new shows are coming up. Um, here I did a reminder this morning saying don't forget log in right now on the fly for the show. Um, and when our recordings are available, I do uh, post about those to let you know when the recording's up. Here's the one from last week. So um, if you are big on Facebook, definitely do um, head over there and like Encompass Live. Other than that, that will wrap it up for this wrap us up for this morning. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, everyone, for attending, and we will see you next week on Encompass Live. Bye bye. Awesome. Thank you. Bye bye.